Hello and welcome to what's possibly a bit of a silly idea. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Alice Clark. For those who do, you've probably followed this here from Twitter. Now, as anyone who follows me on Twitter will know, I'm actually presenting on a conference this week, on Friday, in fact, that may be today, and I'm presenting a paper called Back Pocket Cruisers. Now, when I'm practicing for a paper, if I get a chance to do it on a proper room like this, I will do a practice. And normally when I do a practice, I time it. Well, today I'm not just timing it, I'm also recording it. And the reason I'm recording it is, A, this is my second practice run, it's the only one I'm going to get to do it in a full-size room. And B, I thought it might be nice to put out it out as a video so that all those people who can't be there to see it, but who wanted to see it, can watch it. And also, those people who are there and who get the 20 minute version, get the full version. As I doubt today's is going to be 20 minutes long. In fact, you can all look down the timer and work out how much over I'm going to be. But, fingers crossed, and remember, 20 minutes is the aim. So at any point I'm rushing, you know why. So, back by cruisers, building for the challenge of multi-theatre conflict, grand strategy as forged in steel. I do like pompous titles, don't I? Now, it's actually something which I've been looking at for a while. I've tribal class destroyers, and actually this is what pretty much is a part of the thesis for my book I'm writing, are a critical response the Royal Navy comes up with to trying to fight across the whole world. And they're having to do this because of one thing. Britain's grand strategy. And this is the background for everything that's going on and happened to World War II and all these things. They are the largest empire in the world has ever seen. They are defending, protecting with all this, you know, all the things that come together. But the biggest thing, and the one I haven't written up here, but still deciding whether I should, is avoid war. They wanted to deter conflict. That was the big thing the Royal Navy and the British government were aiming to do. They didn't want to actually have to fight a war. They wanted to forge such a strong position in peace. They wanted to have such strong influence on the world in peacetime, such a stabilizing presence that no one would risk a war with them, that war wouldn't happen. As to an extent, it's the Royal Navy and the British government trying to embody the motto of the Royal Navy's own staff college, CV passum parabellum. I, those who seek peace should prepare for war. If you're well prepared, you can deter the conflict. And that is what they are doing. They're maintaining the strong diplomatic links by having regular Navy visits, lots of diplomats around the world, lots of interaction, trying to keep as close a contact as possible with everyone around the world who is a potential threat or a potential potential threat, and also a potential ally. And they're also trying to bind the empire together as stronger, make it one forged unit, one unit which will be able to project power and therefore preserve peace, because peace is good. Peace allows for trade, peace allows for people to grow old. Remember, overarching all this is the legacy of World War I, of the horrific amount of casualties, of the whole generations of families wiped out, of villages wiped out. No one wants to see that happen again especially as they know how much more destructive it's going to be because they're looking at the new weapons of war coming along. They were charged with making that theory into reality and this is what the Royal Navy is looking at. The Royal Navy is looking at the world and going, this is what we have to protect. These are all the merchant ships, these are the ribbons of commerce which are across the world and are providing not just our own national income, but are the income for all the other nations. As long as these nations are making money, trading prosperously, and are, have got good reasons to not have war, the theory goes, there won't be war. So you've got to keep this trade running at all costs. And that is why the Royal Navy positions cruisers and forces all around the world. And it does this in a very specific command structure. 
This is how the Royal Navy sees the world. It sees it first in terms of trade, and then it sees it in terms of the commands. Now, I have in the past presented papers on the Far East. There is stuff going online about the South Atlantic. All these things are relevant, but when we're talking about destroyers, when we're talking about grand strategy, you have to first look at the areas which they're going to operate in. And destroyers mean the home fleet, North Atlantic, Mediterranean, those are the main areas they are operating in in peacetime. In wartime, they spread out, and there are pockets of destroyers around the world. Don't get me wrong, they're not all staying at home and cruisers out there fight, uh, presenting to the world. But destroyers are mostly at home. Apart from one class, which comes in in the late 1930s. That class was the product of a particular gentleman. That product class was the product of Admiral Henderson. Admiral Henderson was the third sea lord, and he was in many ways a forgotten theorist, as I call them. Now, I've chucked through all that text. You can freeze the screen if you want to see it. And I'll probably delete it from the final version at this rate. But it's always necessary to think about the person who's building the fleet. The Royal Navy has this post of third sea lord, and they are in charge of constructing the fleet. Henderson is that man. And from 1936 onwards, his word is law as far as shipbuilders are concerned. And he stands up to all sorts of people, not least the first sea lord. Um, when there's a fight going on over destroyer sites, so actually destroyers after the tribal class, over whether or not to have smaller crews or bigger crews, and whether or not to have a smaller ship or a bigger ship, he's pointing out that the bigger ship which will, uh, will actually have a smaller crew. And he's making this point for a reason. The reason the first sea lord has been arguing against the bigger destroyers which Henderson wants to build is the crew sizes. Henderson's making the case, well actually no, the bigger ship we can have better equipment in and better equipment can be more self-controlled, easier to access, easier to maintain, it actually requires a smaller crew. He was a factual thinker and he was very, very hard working on making the case for the Navy, on doing a lot of work for the Navy in terms of developing it. He was instrumental in getting the fleet air arm back under the Navy's control. And he does all these things not because he's an ideologue, but because he knows that the best way to command and control, the best way to project power around the world is to keep things organised and to make sure they are ready to deploy. And the trouble with when you're doing, especially this period, inter-service co cooperation, you can be run into problems of politics, which are not anything to do with the services, but to do with the people outside making cases in the papers. So you have a lot of problems going on. Remember, joint force, joint strategy, these things that we talk about a lot today were in imminence in the 1930s. They were part of the 1930s, but they weren't the political catch-all and supported phrase they are these days. In the 1930s, it was far more individual services. Now, the problem they are all facing, and what this paper is tackling, is that the geography, the sheer scale of the commitments that they've got to meet, is so massive and yet the treaties that are talking about them, the Washington and the subsequent London treaties, are limiting tonnage, are limiting number of ships, are limiting things quite heavily. And yes, they mean they limit everyone else, but for the Royal Navy, there are problems. This is why the Royal Navy parlays tonnage of heavy cruisers into light cruisers to try and maximise hull numbers. This is why the Royal Navy makes all sorts of concessions and modifications and proposals with the treaties to try and get the maximum number of ships because 
The biggest thing about covering all that area, covering all that world, is presence. And for that you need numbers of ships. And they need to be viable ships. The solution was to, the Royal Navy looked upon, was to use a specific subset within the destroyers. You were allowed to build destroyer leaders. Now, other navies were turning these vessels into super destroyers, i.e. as destroyer as destroyer they could be. They had tons of torpedoes, they had all the things orientated around the traditional destroyer tasks. The Royal Navy doesn't do this. The Royal Navy goes for tribal class destroyers. And the tribal classes we're going to get to are slightly different. For starters, the tribal class were orientated around their guns. In fact, they had eight. 4.7 inch guns mounted in four double turrets. They did carry depth charges, yes. But as you can see from this line, this ship doesn't look at first glance like a destroyer. She's got a cruiser layout. She's got guns on both ends. It's only when you sort of realise that she's got the torpedoes in the centre and think about her whole size that she starts to become a destroyer, but she's a big destroyer. She is nearly 2,000 tonnes. Theoretically, they're supposed to be 1,850 tonnes. Not a single one comes in at around 1,850 tons. They all come in slightly over. But by the time they're entering service, the treaties have sort of lapsed. So there is a reason for this. The Royal Navy is building these ships as substitute cruisers. They are supposed to take on some of the light cruiser roles. They are supposed to be critical for the A to K line. They are supposed to be critical. The A to K line is the scout line. They are supposed to be critical for filling up diplomatic functions. And they do this. One of the ways they do this is by taking part in diplomatic visits. Now, every single tribal class destroyer was supposed to go and visit the tribe they were named after. And we can all wonder about how HMS Cossack was going to visit the Cossacks in Russia, and how HMS Nubian was going to visit a tribe which by that point didn't exist. But leaving those to one side, the theory was they would all go and visit their people, and this would help bind the empire together. The reality was that only HMS Ashanti, or Asante, depending on who you are, actually managed to visit a, a tribe. And as part of this, she had the Asante priests, the high priests, I'm, I'm not going to try and print the pronounced names because I get it wrong every time, I don't want to insult people, so just go look up the Sante people's high priests, actually did a full blessing on her. And she was presented with a golden bell and a silver bell and a golden shield. I always get the two, slightly wander around. Mm -hmm. Joys of dyslexia. Anyway, leaving that to one side, she gets these presentations and the priests and the high chief actually tell the commander of HMS Asante, that as long as she carries these tokens, she will never be sunk. Disturbingly enough, out of the 16 Royal Navy tribal destroyers, four survived World War II. One of those includes HMS Eskimo, which lost her bow three times in combat mostly. Um, most ships don't consider their bows to be disposable weapons, Eskimo does. Um, another one was HMS Nugent, which was beaten up in every fight she went into, but survived and carried on fighting. And is, the mo oh, after a war spike, the second most decorated ship in Royal Navy service. And considering she only served in World War II, she did blooming well. And then you have HMS Ashanti. She survives, and she's pretty much the only one, because Tata does quite well, but Asante is the only one who survives virtually intact. 
in compared to the damage the others have received and the big bashes they've got, she's done fairly well. So, my theory is that we should actually get the priests from the Asante tribe to bless every royal maybe ship to this day. But when I'm told, when I suggest that, people tend to laugh at me. But look, one in 16 survives virtually intact through World War II. I'd say there's some, fa uh, some evidence going on here. Or at least give them all a silver bell and a golden shield. They were not only involved in that, though. They also took part in diplomacy. When Admiral Cunningham had to visit Istanbul, he took tribal destroyers with him. Yes, he turned up in a battleship, but he also had the tribal destroyers flanking him. He was making a very big statement. That statement was possibly, I don't have enough cruisers to do this job as well as sending a battleship, so here are the tribals. But it worked because they were modern, sleek, powerful looking ships. And in fact, there are more news articles about the tribal destroyers than there are about the battleship. Which is something interesting. Maybe because the Turks were actually considering buying some themselves. Spanish Civil War. HMS Cossack, at one point, becomes an ambulance service. Yes. She basically has to make a high-speed dash after one of the British diplomats is injured. They pick him up in Spain and they take him to the nearest hospital. But they're going all around doing all these things, and all these things are actually traditional cruiser roles. And they're filling in for them. And this frees up cruisers to be in the South Atlantic, to be in the Far East. Remember, the Royal Navy this time are building town class cruisers, Dido class cruisers, all sorts of destroyers, and the tribal destroyers. They are trying to build as many ships as they can, and multi role ships like this free up cruisers, they free up destroyers to go elsewhere because they can fulfill both roles, is the theory. From the get go, the RN tribals are involved in action. They group up with 18th Cruiser Squadron, they group up with 18th Cruiser Squadron up in the North Sea and North Atlantic to try and stop any Germans getting out, any German fleets getting out into the North Atlantic. Uh, but it's Norway where they actually start to be seen a lot of. There is, of course, the Altmark incident, which happens before Norway's even been invaded by the Germans. The Ottmark is a vessel carrying home prisoners, mer a British merchant seaman, taken by the Graf Spey. She's the Graf Spey supply ship, and she's trying to get them home. And she's hiding in a fjord inside of Norway. The Royal Navy knows she's got these people aboard. And there is toing and throwing back between them and the Norwegian government. The Norwegian government basically saying, no, we're sure she doesn't. The Royal Navy going, we're sure she has. And eventually the Royal Navy announces they're going to search her. And a guy called Captain Vian, who's on board, he's commander of HMS Cossack at the time. She's his, one of his part of his flotilla. Leads his ship in. Takes Cossack in past the Norwegian ship, which tried to say, no, you can't go, and he's like, basically, you can follow me. It's been kind of rude. But the reason is, he comes up to the Altmark. Now, the Altmark, first of all, starts, tries to bash him against the wall of the fjord, turns on its flashlights, everything. It's only the handling skills of the tribe which managed to get it out. But again, it's a traditional cruiser role. A cruiser in that situation would possibly have been bashed against the wall. It wouldn't have had the maneuver room. Tribal, slightly smaller, has the manoeuvring. And people then board. This is one of those boarding parties which really should be immortalised into a movie, because we're talking people going across, swinging across on ropes with swords and pistols. It's literally full Pirates of the Caribbean at one point. And they storm the ship. The German crew first try to uh, run off, and then they try to come back. And it's only when they're coming back that they actually start to take casualties because the British then fire them. But what they do find is roughly 400 prisoners taken by the grass bay, merchant seamen, and they free them. And that's critical to the British effort. But it starts off with this 
whole press release going around and after the Battle of the Replace, this is the next big thing really in terms of big Raw maybe event in the press and the shout that goes around is the Navy's here which is this thing which one of the Navy officers apparently shouted when they found the prisoners, don't worry the Navy's here and again for the Royal Navy this was a very important thing because it was living up to their trade protection role which is how they market themselves in the interwar years then you have the Battle of Narvik now the Battle of Narvik uh, are kind of interesting you have the first battle which is the German invasion where the Norwegian other defences get overwhelmed you have the second battle where the H-class flotilla of Royal Navy destroyers goes into Narvik not quite sure if there's any German presence there and get beaten up by the larger German destroyers. Then you have this third or second battle, if you're the Royal Navy, of Narvik. Now, this battle is famous for two reasons. One, HMS Warspite goes along, and two, the Germans absolutely round themselves ashore to get themselves away from the Royal Navy destroyers. It's also a battle where HMS Eskimo managed to lose her bow. Pretty much what happens and is different in the final battle of Narvik is that the Warspite launches its Swordfish Scout aircraft. I know some of them were on battleships in their sort of flying boat, seaplane configuration. It's not really elegant, but it works. And that scouted ahead. And so it leads to such things as a German destroyer, which was waiting, which had been partially damaged, so it was actually hiding in an ambush position. Before it could even fire, all the ship's guns coming around the corner were pointed on it. And it gets deluged under fire from three tribal destroyers and their torpedoes and their guns, everything's firing at it. And well, it's already sinking, and then War Spike comes around the corner and fires its 15 inch shells at it, and the poor thing just blows up. But most of the German destroyers get completely burnt out, smashed, everything. At one point, Cossack rams herself into a harbour and starts engaging everything that's in the harbour and basically methodically wiping out anything the Germans can use. It's real vengeance blood grudge match, and the reason is quite so horrific in parts is because the H flotilla had traditionally been attached with the tribals, they'd operated together quite a lot. And the tribals, when the H flotilla was sent in on their own, that's because the tribals were off doing something else. Quite a lot of the tribal captains who were involved in this later second fight for the Royal Navy in Narvik were friends with the H crews and felt that, frankly, that if the H crews were going to be sent on this sort of mission, this scout mission, which was a sort of traditional cruiser role or a tribal destroyer role, then the tribal should have been with them. And if the tribals had been with them, they would never have been mauled quite so badly as they have been. What's the important of Narvik though is the damage it does to the German destroyer fleet. If there can be simply one single operation which makes the theory of sea lion being actually carried out, the German invasion of Britain being carried out a very, very remote possibility, as much effort as the Germans put into it. It's their loss of destroyers at Narvik because it stops them being able to do the things they need to do to really project a fleet. There wasn't really much chance before when they had them actually, and considering how critical they've been to Norway invasion, the loss of them should have made them stop right in the sea line, but it doesn't, and these things happen. But Norway isn't over there. We also have Namsos. Now Namsos is when the British and the French go into Norway. And this is part of a crucial area to the central campaign. The, Norway, uh, the campaign in central Norway. And just general. Uh, Carson D. Williams. He is various forms of general through World War II. He is... I don't know, there is really no real equivalent of him in modern world. Um, he loses an arm fighting, he carries on fighting, he loses 
um, eye, he's wearing an eye patch. He is almost an embodiment of Nelson at one point, um, um, he's lost the wrong arm. And he just keeps on fighting. He's an indomitable spirit. Namsos, the tribal class, are critical for him. They are small enough to get in the fjords, so they bring the troops in. But they are large enough, he can use them as a command base, he can use them as this and that, all, all sorts of things to support his operation. And he does. And then when he's ordered to withdraw, he is actually shocked that, and in his words, this poor Donald Kirk, the Royal Navy doesn't understand the word impossible. They just do it. They tell him they're going to withdraw his entire force in a night. He doesn't think it's possible. They do. They take off as much of the supplies, as much of the stores, everything they can, goes onto these destroyers, is got out to freighters, and destroyers come back and got out the freighters. Everything is done and these ships are got home. But Norway is not without its other firsts. There was the first loss, HMS Gurkha, and she was soon followed by Afridi. Gurkha is an interesting one. She's actually lost charging an air attack. Now, this sounds really silly, but actually it's quite a sort of understood tactic at the time. You see, there were two beliefs about how to defend the merchant ship, especially, and that's what they were doing. They're defending the forces, getting air, leaving um, Norway. They were under air attack and they couldn't get their guns to bear as the enemy were just too far away. And it was a constant attack. So HMS Gurkha's commander, who's a gunnery officer, and knows they can't get the angle right, turns out and charges them to try and bring his guns to bear, to drive off the enemy air attack so it won't get through to the merchant ships. Now, these days we of course consider that silly and later on in World War II the concept was to have the barrage and the ships would maintain formation just keep firing but this is early in the war this is 1940 they're still developing these tactics Captain Vian who's the officer in the flotilla commander at this time writes of it afterwards he should have remonstrated with the commander of Gurkha to stop him doing it but honestly that's in hindsight. In practice, they charged. The aircraft then all concentrate on Gurkha and the rest of the force gets away. Gurkha gets sunk. But it sort of lives up to the name of the fighting Gurkhas. Not many ships have been sunk charging in air attack. After this, what do the tribals do? Well, they have all sorts of other operations. They are involved in the Lofoten raids, Operation Claymore, the first major commando operation. And this is a critical operation for the Royal Navy. It's a critical operation for the British government. It's a critical operation for what would come later in the war. And the tribal destroyers make this possible. They have the space, they have the firepower, they can provide the fire support. They are general purpose ships. So. The Royal Navy can send them in and they don't need to send a lot of our supporting forces. And that's what they do. They go it in, they drop off the troops. They have another destroyer, them, which is a specialist air defence destroyer. But they are very much critical to the operation. And all this is starting to make the Royal Navy think. Yes, they have got the Australians, Canadians building more tribal destroyers, but they're starting to lose them and these ships are becoming more and more critical. In the Mediterranean, you have the Battle of Macapan, where the four, two ships chosen to keep contact between Cunningham's forward cruisers racing after the Italian fleet and the main fleet to keep the connection going, keep the information flowing and stop them losing contact, are his two tribal destroyers. The two destroyers he can most rely on to survive, to fight, to be out there on their own exposed and still get back, and this is at night. You have the convoys going on. There is a brilliant scene of Operation Pedestal, but there's all sorts of other things. And actually, the Second Battle of Sirte is another convoy operation where one of the Royal Navy's destroyers, HMS Somali, drives off an Italian battleship, pretty much solo. 
I say pretty much because there are technically two other destroyers of it, but they are shrouded in the smoke it's producing to cover the merchant ships, so they can't really see what they're firing at. And all the Italians can really see is one destroyer charging at them like a nutter. And so they decide not to. There's also the Battle of Cape Bon. And the Battle of Cape Bon is interesting because when the Royal Navy was building the tribal destroyers, the debate was to have built tribal destroyers of roughly 1,850 tons, or to build a light, light cruiser of 2,500, 3,000 tons. At Cape Bon, um, these destroyers of the Royal Navy annihilate two cruisers of that size of the Italian Navy. Kind of suggests that the Royal Navy made the right decision, but it too much can be drawn from it, but it's an interesting battle to look at. And so you have the battle class being ordered. They start being considered in 1940, 1941. They worked on, they're basically building up one of the designs which Henderson had come up with before he died. Unfortunately, he had died in 1940. So he, after building the fleet, is basically worked to death. And they ordered two classes, the battle class and the weapon class. And these were going to be the fleet destroyers that were going to take over the Royal Navy for about 1944 onwards, was the plan. They were going to come in and they were going to be the big destroyers. You had the Cavalier class, the ships of the Cap like Cavalier belong to the sea, the sea classes. These were the critical destroyers which the Royal Navy was trying to churn out in as much numbers as possible to make up their losses. But these ships were the ships which they were looking at for their fighting force. And you can really see the similarities between the battle class and the tribal class. You've got the rake of the bow, you've got the shape and the structure, you've got the double guns. But you can also see what the benefits of being free from the treaties were. Because instead of having that system where they are not turrets, they're actually shields around the guns, they're mounts. These are actually turreted mounts. And so they provide the crew with just that more protection. Not a lot more protection. Honestly, they ain't that heavily armoured, but they provide more protection. There's also far more AA weaponry down the back, and these ships are crammed. The thing you really hear about the battle class is how crammed they are full of stuff. But they're only starting to be ordered in 1942, and so therefore they don't really come into that much. So, war goes on. The Battle of Lushant. Now, again, tribal class destroyers, what are they going to get used for? In D-Day, are they going to be part of the amphibious operation? Are they going to be part of the invasion? Actually, they're the covering force. Their job is to make sure no German forces come this way at Normandy. They're to make sure that they are protected. So, that is what they do, and they do it rather well. Um, when the Germans do try to come and they come in force, they bump in, into a bunch of Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy dis uh, tribal destroyers who go, uh, you're not getting past us. And they get driven off very decisively. But they don't actually turn that round. So, in later on in the war, about 1945, they're taking part in Operation Irregular, which is out in the Far East. And Eskimos out there, Cossacks out there, not, not Cossack, um, Tata is out there, Cossack is sunk on course uh, in the war. They are out there, they are tracking down basically Japanese movements. They are deployed on their own, far away from any supporting fleet. The fl they are as far away from any supporting forces as you can possibly imagine. And they are tracking down the movements of Japanese forces in islands approaching Singapore. They are clearing the path for an invasion fleet which might come. They are starting to uh, sort of stop the ability of the enemy to interdict any force heading towards Singapore because Britain was planning on retaking Singapore. It was an idea being considered. So, tribals were out in front trying to sort of clear the path. And the battle class sort of in the service. One or two of them actually get into service before World War II ends. One of them even gets out to the Far East. But the tribals have been the dominant ones through. However, the battles enter service and they become a critical force for the next few years. But they are crowned. And the trouble is to return to a peacetime force. And the peacetime force has needs. 
again for cruises, again for going around that world and having presence. And the trouble is when you're doing presence, you need space to entertain, you also need to be impressive. So, the Royal Navy takes the idea of the tribal destroyers, the lessons of the battles in terms of their increased armament of the size, and puts them into these, so daring class. They have more torpedoes. These are the missiles of their day. These are the ship killing weapons. And they have eight. So they have more torpedoes than the tribals ever had. But they also have these big, powerful 4.5 inch gun turrets. Again, with a far higher angle of firing, so they can deal with more damage to aircraft, but also they are turreted, they are protected. It's carrying lots of air defense guns, and it's got on the back anti submarine mortars. So it's all this, and it's subdivided a lot. This is a very, very well designed ship. And it's 75% even bigger than the tribals were. Now, what's interesting to this day is, of course, HMCS Haida survives in Canada, tribal class destroyer, the last remaining one of them, and HMAS Vampire survives in Australia, which is the last surviving daring class destroyer in the world. Um, there are no British survivors, and there are no survivors to my knowledge of the battle class, which is rather a shame. So you have the two ends. But these ships matter because they are the coming of the modern destroyer. Prior to these ships, destroyers had been torpedo boats. They've been about fighting battles with torpedoes, about killing enemies and sinking with torpedoes, and maybe engaging other destroyers. The tribal destroyers are the first ships which are built with the idea that these ships are going to have to have more than torpedoes, and they're going to have to engage more with their guns than just other destroyers. And they're going to have to be used for things more than just. In fact, they can be used for things more than just being destroyers, more than just being escorts. They can be used for cruising, for presence operations, for those sort of diplomatic missions. So they are the parentage of the modern general purpose destroyer. They're what it becomes. So, I know, again, it's a bit pompous, but we might change it. Might. That one. That's the background that's been there the whole way through. You can see the evolution. Tribal, to battle, to daring. Cossack, sleaze, daring. They all have a similar pronouncement. They are all designed with a bearing. They are general purpose destroyers in a time when general purpose was needed, but it wasn't yet that understood below the cruiser level. For those who want more information, go to Global Maritime History. You'll find some articles about tribal class destroyers on there. And if you want to ask me questions, go to at AC Naval History. You share as well. Hope you enjoyed and hope I actually post this. It's going to depend on how bad it is. Take care.